Hi everyone, this is Dr. Legault and we are talking about the anatomy of the heart circulation and conduction today. So let's go ahead and get started. There's nothing to reveal and we're going to start with what is a heart. So here is a nice image of the heart from a cadaver and as you can see left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. The heart is composed of three layers, and those layers are your epicardium, your myocardium, and your endocardium. The heart is contained within a pericardial sac, which has a parietal outer layer and an inner visceral layer. There are several arteries that supply oxygen to the heart. Um, these are called the coronary arteries, and they originate from your aorta, the sinus of Valsalva. This image demonstrates your right coronary artery going down the right ventricle and supplying the inferior wall, as well as the left anterior descending artery coming off the left main and the left circumflex artery. All these arteries have branches as well. The dominance of the coronary artery system is based on which give rise to your PDA or your posterior dominant artery. 85% of the time this is the right side and the other 15% is the left circ. The RCA as it rises from the order gives rise to the SA node 60% of the time and the AV node 80% of the time. So sometimes when there's RCA infarction you can get a bundle branch block due to this. As we mentioned before, the left main gives rise to LAD in the circ. The D in diagonals and the D in LAD is an easy way to remember how these two are, are correlated. And which part of the heart do these arteries supply? I already kind of mentioned it. This is a transthoracic imaging. As you can see, the Doppler beam hits the anterior part of the heart first. And the anterior part of the heart, as well as the septal, is supplied by your LAD, your RV as well as the inferior part is supplied by the RCA and the left circumflex does the lateral portion of the heart. We can also look on EKG to see what parts, what leads correlate with this. Um, this EKG imaging we hear sees pictures of uh, normal in this first one. Um, we have some ST elevations here, we have a Q wave here, and possible some ischemia here. Now in the OR we can use echo to help look at the heart. This image here is a picture of a heart patient's on ECMO and it's not beating very well. Now coronary blood flow, what happens the blood leaves the sinus valsalva and goes to the heart and then the heart tissue extracts your oxygen. Normal at rest we consume most of the oxygen that, that your heart gets. Um, the perfusion formula it's your aortic diastolic blood pressure minus your left ventricular and diastolic blood pressure. Your blood flow is 60 to 90 um, and this is increased during exercise. We have autoregulation um, but this also shows that when there's ischemia or stenosis within the heart, you're already extracting a lot of oxygen. So when the demand increases, it's very easy for the heart to, to get an injury because it can't keep up. Once the arteries supply oxygen to the heart, the blood drains into the coronary veins. Um, it drains eventually into the coronary sinus, which runs into the right atrium. For that, it mainly drains into the great cardiac vein as well as the middle and small cardiac veins. And this slide depicts what was said on the previous slide. Real quick, the chambers, we have the right atrium, which has a right atrial appendage, ostium for the coronary sinus, and attachment for IVC and SVC. The right ventricle has a tricuspid valve to get into it and pulmonic valve on the other side. And there's also papillary muscles. S special to the RV is there is a moderator band 
which is not seen in the left ventricle. Here is a cadaver image of the right heart. And you can see the papillary muscles. And I believe the moderator band is cut or maybe partially left there. Tricuspid valve. Left heart has four pulmonary veins that drain into it with the oxygenated blood. There's a left atrial appendage. This is a spot where sometimes um, clots can form in patients with atrial fibrillation. You get your mitral valve, goes into the LV. Once again, there's papillary muscles and your aortic valve before the blood leaves to go to systemic circulation. Here's the cadaver image cross section of the left heart. Now moving past the arterial supply and venous supply in the heart, we talk about the conduction system. And this is a nice picture of it. The SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. And this is at the junction of SVC and RA near the sulcus terminalis. The AV node comes next, and it's in the posterior inferior interatrial septum near the coronary sinus osteum. And then once the conduction occurs, it goes down the interventricular septum through the bundle branches. And there's a left, which has an anterior and posterior and a right. And then it finally goes deep to the subendocardial Purkinje fibers. And this is all shown here in the picture. This states what was stated in the previous slide. Intervention, there's an autonomic nervous system. So it has superficial and deep cardiac plexuses. There's a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system as well that innervate the heart. Moving on from the heart, blood leaves and goes to the aorta. And when we talk about the aorta, we talk about different parts of it. First off, it's the ascending part. And right away after the aortic valve is the sinus valsalva, then the sinotubular junction, then the mid-ascending aorta, turns into an arch, and then later into the descending aorta. And all the numbers correlate with which parts of the aorta that is. The aorta, as well as blood vessels, have three different layers. There's an intimal inner layer, there's a media middle layer, and there's an outer adventitial layer. And they each have different components in them. Here's an image of those three layers demonstrating the intima, the media, as well as the adventitia. This is just showing uh, aortic dissection. This is a disease that occurs. It's actually a tear in the intimal layer, in between the intimal and the medial layer, um, and the blood gets contained usually within that, as opposed to rupturing all the way. And there's a couple of different classifications, depends on where the dissection is, whether it's in the ascending aorta, all the way, or just the descending. This clip here is uh, an echo image. It's a very, very awful picture of a descending aorta. And what is showing in this is there's plaque. And these are mobile plaques. So this patient's at a very high stroke risk when he has surgery or when he doesn't have surgery. Blood supply to the organs. This is a cartoon picture of all the arterial supply that we have. And it shows how everything's connected. Cardiac output to the other organs. Um, since your major organs get about 20% of the cardiac output, as you can see here, the brain, kidneys, um, GI tract, still gets about 20%, and you can see where the rest of the distribution goes. Contrast your blood volume, it primarily lives in your venous system, is where it stores all the blood, 64% uh, versus 15% in the arterial system. So that's overall anatomy, circulation, conduction of the heart. We're going to review a few electrolytes in the heart before we are finished with this presentation. The main electrolytes that we think about dealing with the heart, the first one that comes to mind is potassium. Um, so somebody with hypokalemia, they're going to have an abnormal EKG. And what happens is this is due to delayed ventricular repolarization you can get the T wave to be flat, inverted. Classically, you get a U wave, and the mnemonic is you need more potassium. So you get the U wave. 
You also get some ST depression, increased P wave, prolonged PR, and arrhythmias, once again because of delayed repolarization. Um, on top of these EKG, EKG changes, which I have described, you can have decreased cardiac contractility, in general arrhythmias, labile blood pressure, as well as this can potentiate digitalis. Hyperkalemia is the opposite of the previous slide, obviously. And what we see with this is you start out with a peaked T wave, which later gets a widened QRS. You get a prolonged P to R. Eventually you lose your P wave. You lose your R wave amplitude, as you can see. You get the ST depression. Then she turns into a sine wave and eventually V-fib and asystole to follow. This is also due to delayed repolarization. Usually you, know, you, you don't see changes to your potassium is about six and a half or seven. Low magnesium, um, your heart can become irritable. You can also have potentiation of digitalis, increased incidence of atrial fibrillation. Classically, one thing we worry about is prolonged QT syndrome, which is can turn into torsades and the treatment choice for this is magnesium. EKG, you're going to see a prolonged PR as well as a prolonged QT interval. If you have too much magnesium, you can get some vasodilation, bradycardia, myocardial depression, and your EKG can prolong the PR interval as well as a widened QRS. And if you get too much in the levels of you know, 10, 15, 20, you can get respiratory and cardiac arrest. Low calcium will cause some decreased cardiac contractility, hypotension. And on EKG, classic is QT prolongation with some cardiac irritability. Hypercalcemia, you get hypertension and you get a short QT interval as well as a short ST segment. And you can also have some increased cardiac sensitivity to digitalis with hypercalcemia. Low phosphate, it's um, mild, moderate, asymptomatic. Now, when it's severe low phosphate, that's when you actually get some symptoms, such as cardiopathy, hemolysis, hemolysis, platelet dysfunction, and metabolic acidosis. Too much phosphate, it may lower your plasma calcium levels, and you'll get the changes, such as when you have low calcium. Those are my references, and that is the end of this presentation. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day.